Hey guys, welcome back. We're heading into a whole new part of the class. We've just finished up states of matter and thermodynamics, uh, and prior to that we've been talking about Newtonian physics and Einsteinian gravity and things like this. We're now moving into a whole new part of the course on waves, wave energy, and uh, how it impacts our lives on a daily basis. Um, everything from electromagnetics, magnetics, um, even into um, Einstein's theory of relativity will all be discussed in the coming uh, set of lectures. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention as we go through because there's some really fascinating stuff ahead of us. All right, so today we're going to we're going to hit it off with a little lecture on waves. Um, and here's a nice uh, image here, and notice these little ripples here. These little ripples, which are propagating across, are waves. Waves in this uh, light energy moving across. So let's start our, our conversation. So vibration of waves, a vibration is a periodic wiggle in time. That's all it is. It's just a wiggle in time. Something moving up and down, up and down, up and down. That's all it is. Um, a periodic wiggle in both space and time is a wave because this wiggle can move. And if it's moving, it becomes a wave. A wave extends from one place to another. Uh, exa typical examples, of course, being light, which is an electromagnetic wave, we'll be talking about that extensively, and sound, which is a mechanical wave that needs a medium, we'll be talking about that extensively. So, one of the easiest ways to kind of understand the difference between a wave and a vibration is to look at vibrations of a pendulum. So here is an apparatus over here, notice that there's a mass hanging from a string, um, the text over here uses the example of a stone. Um, and when you do this, you could grab this thing and you could swing it back and forth. This is a vibration because it's not propagating a wave anywhere. It's all happening right here in place. It's not moving. So the pendulum swings to and fro at a rate that depends only on the length of the pendulum. So if you want it to spin faster, you shorten the pendulum length. If you want to spin or to vibrate slower, you uh, have a longer string. That's the reason why grandfather clocks with their large pendulums keeping time move so slowly, whereas little tiny clocks actually move quite quite rapidly. Those of you that are familiar with those types. Um, it does not depend upon the mass, just as mass does not affect the rate at which a ball falls to the ground, right? Uh, this is a, a principle called the equivalence theory, right? There is an increase in force but there's also a corresponding increase in inertia, which offsets that increase in force. So we get the um, we get the equivalence principle kind of laid out for us. Um, the time of one to and fro swing is called a period. So every time it moves up and back, up and back, that's a period. Uh, the longer the length of a pendulum, the longer the period. We just kind of describe that. So you kind of have the idea. This is a, a typical pendulum. But we can move pendulums. Imagine now, because this is a vibration moving back and forth just in place. Um, if we were to take that same pendulum and move it through time, through through space and time, as opposed to just keeping it in one spot, we'll actually generate a wave. Let's see that. So matter of fact, here is a pendulum right here. This gentleman here, he's basically got a pendulum. He's depositing, I believe that's sand actually. It's a little layer of sand. And as the pendulum moves up and down, you'll notice that it sketches out a wave pattern here right? So wave is pictorially represented by something called a sine wave. Uh, a sine wave, the, the word sine is derived from trigonometry. Um, we're not going to really get into the details of this math at all. Don't worry about it. But just know that it's called a sine wave. Um, a sine curve is obtained when you trace out the path of a vibrating pendulum over time. Remember, in this case, we're moving the thing over space and time. So you just put some sand in the pendulum, let it swing, the sand drops onto the paper, and it basically sketches out the sine curve on the paper. That's the result. All right. So here's a kind of a quick description of what that wave looks like. Right? We're draw. We're this is that kind of a similar wave to this one here. And we can imagine that when a bob vibrates up and down. So in this case, instead of using a pendulum, this is a different kind of pendulum. Something moving straight up and down, a bob on a spring. Uh, employing something called Hooke's Law, if you remember. Uh, Hooke's Law is also will sketch out a curve, because imagine as we're moving this paper, according to these arrows, we're moving it from left to right, um, we're just pulling that paper, this bob is moving back and forth. And as it's doing so, it's also sketching out a sine curve. So these two apparatuses are closely related to one another. Um, a marking pen traces out the sine curve on the paper that moves horizontally at constant speed. 
And what do we get? We get a wavelength, right? The wavelength in this case is going to be from something called the crest to the crest. We also measure it from some point here on the wave down below down to some point here or trough to trough or right at this point here in the middle, the equilibrium point to this point here. And then the height of the wave, or I'm sorry, the amplitude of the wave is the distance between the mid vibration point, the midpoint between all of this stuff and to the top or to the crest, right? That's going to give you the amplitude. So vibration wave care, we actually need to go through these descriptions, but I've kind of just mentioned them. Crests are the high points, that's up here, up here. The troughs are the low points, those are down here, down here. The amplitude is the distance from the midpoint to the crest. So we've talked about the amplitude, that's just from here to here, or from here to here. And of course the wavelength is the wavelength is the distance or the total length of any wave. And the easiest places to measure it, of course, is from the the crest of the crest or the trough to the trough, or if you have the ability to find a kind of a random spot here and find that same random spot here, you can measure it there. Either way, the wavelength is still going to be the same. Now it's getting a little more um, complicated at this point. Not, not a lot more complicated, but you kind of got to follow it. Um, an another issue is the frequency of waves, and this is specifies the number of two and fo uh, to and fro uh, vibrations at a given time. So um, if you have something that is moving back and forth slowly, like that grandfather clock I was talking about, moving really slowly the pendulum, the frequency of that pendulum is some relatively small number. But if you have a smaller clock with a little tiny pendulum moving back and forth, the frequency is a lot greater. And, and those of you that actually ha have ever had the benefit of a wind-up watch. Basically, it's the same thing, except in that case, the pendulum is a, round, is a wound up spring, um, and that uh, vibration is even faster. Um, and they all are able to keep track of time. Um, so what is the frequency in this case? Uh, well, not only to and fro, fro vibrations, but it's also the number of waves. So it's not just things that are staying in one place, like in a clock, but the number of waves passing a point per second. So if you have, uh, say, four ocean waves go past you um, per second, uh, we would say that that is four hertz, um, the unit of frequency being hertz after a guy named Heinrich Hertz. Um, and basically the definition is one hertz is a vibration that occurs once each second. By the way, then getting an ocean wave four per second is very unusual. <laughs> That's the, they're usually about every 20 seconds, so the... the uh, uh, the real number is, is as some fraction of a hertz. Um, mechanical objects such as pendulums have frequencies of a few hertz. Sound has a frequency of a few hundred or thousand hertz. And radio waves have frequencies of a few million hertz. This is a lot of waves going past you. And cell phones operate a few billion hertz, or what we call gigahertz. By the way, million hertz, MHZ is megahertz. Okay, So here we can see two waves in this image here that have different frequencies, right? We're going to make the assumption that the red wave and the blue wave are both traveling at the same speed, but notice that the blue wave has more crests. It also has more troughs, uh, whereas the red wave only has two. So the frequency uh, ratio to this is two to one, right? This is going to have twice the frequency of the red wave behind it. So the period uh, mathematically is related to the frequency. Um, the time to complete one vibration is going to be 1 divided by the frequency. If you know the frequency, it's the reciprocal of the period, back and, back and forth between these two. So in a, an example, a pendulum take, uh, makes two vibrations in one second. The frequency is therefore 2 hertz. The period, which is the reciprocal of 2, is 1 half second. Okay? You see how those two things are related? You just have to understand that they're reciprocals of one another. All right, so now we've kind of gotten the description of a wave out of, you know, out of the way. Um, let's go ahead and talk about how waves actually move and what a wave actually is in nature. So first off, we have to understand what is moving. Waves transport energy, not matter, right? Um, for an example, if you drop a stone in a quiet pond and the resulting ripples carry no water across the pond. So in this case, there's a drop here falling into the middle of this pond. You'll notice that there's a... The, the ripples go out, and there are these concentric circles that ring out in every direction. But the water that impacted here 
is not moving on top of this wave. So this wave is not made up of water that is from over here. The water over here has stayed over here. The water over here has stayed over here. But the energy, the ripple itself, has moved the matter uh, up and down as it moves across the water surface here. So there's no flow of water in this direction, or flow of water in this direction, or flow of water in this direction. Um, waves travel across a grass uh, on a windy day, right? So if the if you see a wave of of move across grass, that doesn't mean the grass is moving, right? It just means that there's a wave of energy that is going across that. Uh, molecules in air propagate a distance. Uh, a, I'm sorry. Uh, molecules in air propagate a disturbance through air. All right, that's what's happening. So the disturbance is moving, but not the actual molecules, at least not very much. So wave speed describes how fast the disturbance moves through a medium. So here we have a uh, picture of this, right? Um, we see a bird up here <laughs> on, a, uh, on a piling out at sea, and this wave is one meter. Um, uh, wavelength is one meter. Um, the velocity here is one meter per second. So how long is it going to take for this thing to hit? Uh, it's going to take a second, right? Because it's moving one meter per second. So related to uh, frequency and wavelength of a wave, that wave speed equals the frequency times the wavelength. Pretty neat, right? Very straightforward. If you can take this and write this down in your notes, wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Uh, that will be a useful uh, relationship to keep in mind, especially in future chapters, especially when we get to light. Uh, an example, a wave with a wa wavelength of one meter and a frequency of one hertz has a speed of one meter per second. Okay. There are two kinds of waves that we traditionally deal with. There are actually other kinds of waves, especially if you get into seismics uh, or earthquakes. Um, but even those kind of break down into the two basic kinds. So there are two common types of waves. And they differ in that they have different ways that they vibrate the medium in which they travel. So one of them are the longitudinal waves, the other one are the transverse waves. And so imagine a longitudinal wave. This would be, say, a slinky or a, a material in a vacuum, um, or I'm sorry, a material in, a, in the atmosphere. And these basically, these waves are pulses or clumps together of material, and then in the middle it gets, it gets reduced, right? So this is propagating in this direction here from left to right. And this pulse is going to move in this direction. This is called a longitudinal wave. Uh, conversely, we have the transverse wave. This is where you take a, a rope and you move it up and down. You move it up and down right here. And what it does is it creates a wave that moves through here. This is called the transverse wave. This is what we usually think of when we think of a wave. But this is also a wave. In this case, you'll notice that the, the um, amplitude of this wave is not necessarily measurable in an easy way on this longitudinal wave. But what we can measure very easily is the wavelength. We notice the wavelength here is the same as the wavelength here because this middle one here is right in the middle of that cluster. That one here is in the middle of that cluster. This is a, trop a peak, I'm sorry, or a crest. And here's a crest and they coincide. So we can measure the period. So longitudinal waves our medium, uh, basically where the medium vibrates parallel to direction of energy transfer. So here's a person setting up, um, I like this kind of these classical photos, um, but here we see the sounds coming in and basically it's pressing or compressing in different zones. We'll talk about what these lines are here in a short while. Um, but basically it's pressing and compressing these waves out. And so these compressions are these zones right here, and this is where the wave is compressed. There's rarefactions, which is the stretch region between the compression, so that would be these areas here where you don't see the waves. And back here, this would be a rarefaction right here. This would be your compression right here. An example would be sound waves in solid, liquid, and gas. This is how sound waves move. They're longitudinal waves. Transverse waves are a little different. This is where the medium vibrates perpendicularly to the direction of energy transfer. So in this case, this is moving up and down, but the waves are moving in a perpendicular direction towards the wall. So this gives you side to side uh, movement. So typical examples would be a vibration and stretch strings on musical instruments. Radio waves do this too. Light waves, believe it or not, do this. And of course, S waves, these are surface waves, um, or secondary waves actually, that travel in the ground providing geologic information. So S waves are uh, a type of earthquake wave. All right, remember we're going to talk about those lines that were coming out 
back here. You remember that you see these lines of that are kind of cutting through the compressions and the uh, rarefactions. Okay. This is due to something called wave interference. So wave interference occurs when two or more waves interact with each other because they occur in the same place at the same time. So here we see two spots of energy that have been imposed on the surface here. This is actually a computer generated image, but you get the idea. Um, the superposition principle is something to understand when mapping these things out. The displacement due to the interference of waves is determined by adding the disturbances produced by each wave. So if you have uh, two waves moving past each other, uh, you have to understand that they're going to either add or subtract one from another, right? They're going to have an effect one on the other. So in the constructive interference of the superposition, superposition principle, when the crest of one wave overlaps the crest of another, their individual effects add together to produce a wave of increased amplitude. So if you have one crest stacked on top of another crest, you're going to get twice as large a crest. That's kind of the idea or you're going to get a larger crest. So you're going to have that additive effect, I should say. That's kind of better stated. Uh, you can also get destructive interference when the crest of one wave overlaps the trough of another. The high part of the one wave simply fills in the low part of the other, so their individual effects are reduced or even canceled out. And so that's what's happening here. Here we can see that there's a peak here, and it bends, peak here, and it bends, and these are places where they're overlapping somewhat. So you see a, a zone right here where you see destructive interference and then right through here we see a big wide zone of constructive interference, right? And that's what we're seeing also back on this photo here. We see a zone of destructive interference right here, another zone of destructive and here is the constructive interference. This is designed actually to concentrate sound waves right here in the middle and to kind of reduce its effect elsewhere. So this is kind of a able to direct sound in a specific direction. That's what this apparatus is designed to do. So that leads us to our conversation on standing waves. Now I haven't mentioned standing waves before, but standing waves are a type of wave where a wave is basically interfering with itself, um, usually through, a, through reflection. So if we tie a rope to a wall and shake the free end up and down, so that's what this person here is doing. They're taking a rope and they're, they're swinging it. Um, we produce a train of waves in the rope, right? You're moving it back and forth. It's going to make waves. The wall is too rigid to shake, so the waves are reflected back along the rope. They come right back to you. And by shaking the rope just right, we can cause the incident and reflected waves to form a standing wave. In other words, they, you can make it so the reflected wave and the, and the wave that you're creating, the incident wave, the one that you're creating, can actually stack on top of each other, right? And so we can get um, periods or locations where we get really large vibrations and other places where there's none. So where those places that there's none, those are called nodes. Nodes are the regions of minimal or zero displacement with minimal or zero energy. So here we see this guy is, is shaking this thing. Uh, there's a zone of maximum energy here and the minimum er energy zones are actually here right at the wall and here. But if he goes a little bit faster, he's actually able to create a zone of low energy right here in the middle, a node right in the middle. And if he increases the, the frequency, he now has two nodes right here in the middle with zones of high energy here. By the way, these zones of high energy are called antinodes. So antinodes are the regions of maximum displacement and maximum energy. And of course, antinodes and nodes occur equally apart from each other. So if you look at the distance from here to here, it's the same as the distance from here to there and vice versa. And so you can see that it's pretty straightforward geometry. Um, so here we have one antinode, no nodes, one node, two antinodes, two nodes, three antinodes, you know, and you can kind of see the pattern working out here. So same thing. So a typical example would be a wave in a violin, a violin string or a guitar string or a piano string. Actually, standing waves actually form in, all instru in almost all instruments, trumpets, trombones, tubas, clarinets, violins, so on and so forth. Basically, you're, when you're manipulating the pitch in an instrument, you're manipulating the length and the node and antinode structure of a standing wave inside that instrument. Cool. So now that we've kind of covered standing waves and the different kinds of waves, we've got kind of a last, uh, a kind of a final series of, of phenomena that we have to discuss. And one is to 
to understand bow waves. And the reason why we need to understand bow waves is because this is the kinds of waves that we actually deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, especially when we're dealing with swimming conditions, if we're, if we're fisher, uh, you know, going out and fishing or, or, or we happen to be out flying kites or whatever. These are the kinds of waves that we deal with pretty frequently. Um, so there's a couple phenomena in here we need to be aware of. We have something called a wave barrier, and uh, a wave barrier is simply where waves superimpose directly on top of one another producing a wall. Um, that occurs when the object making the sound or making the waves is traveling at the same speed as the wave itself. So in this case, this would be item number B. There's an object here that's moving, and what's doing is it's moving at the same speed as the water or the wave, right? And the fact that it's moving at the same velocity as the wave means that the waves can never get out of the, get out of the way of one another. All right. If it was traveling less than this, we would actually see a different effect. We would see that the circles would become concentric, but they would be offset one from another. And you'll notice that if you're looking at the wavelengths here versus the wavelengths behind this moving velocity, um, this is a longer wavelength than here. So if this was something moving, say a fire truck moving through the you know through the town with its sirens blazing, it's going to have a different pitch coming towards you than it is going to have when it moves away from you. In fact, it should have a higher pitch because the vibrations are quicker. Um, in other words, there's a higher, there's a shorter wavelength and therefore there's a higher uh, uh, frequency. Higher frequency is a higher pitch. Um, so that's the reason why when a fire engine comes towards you, it sounds like it has a high pitch and as it moves away from you and the siren moves away from you, it suddenly drops off and gets lower and lower and lower with distance. This is something called the Doppler effect. Um, in this case, you're going just the same speed. Now what happens if you go faster than the waves? If you're going faster than the waves, that's actually something called supersonic, right? In the, in the case of sound waves. But if you're just going faster than, than, the, than the waves can travel, say, in water, you just start forming something called a wake, right? Um, so this would be the difference between a wake and a no-wake zone in a, uh, in a harbor, for example. So here the velocity exceeds the, the speed of the waves. Uh, supersonic aircraft is, is a typical example, right, because the airplane can fly f faster than the speed of sound. That's faster than sound waves. So a bow wave is a V-shaped form of ov overlapping waves, right, that, that wave barrier we're speaking about up here, when objects travel faster than wa wave speed. An increase in speed will produce a narrower V-shape of overlapping waves. So here we see the original uh, velocity exceeding the waves, and as we go faster, you'll notice that this cone, or this angle between the top and the bottom of this cone of waves moving out, um, shrinks. It actually gets smaller. And of course, understanding that, you'll understand that basically these, uh, these overlaps, and that when you go over the speed of that the waves, when they're all piled up, produces a lot of energy. And that energy, when it, when it impacts things, is something called a shock wave. So the shock wave is a pattern of overlapping spheres that form a cone from objects traveling faster than the speed of sound. So here's our airplane, not that different than the than this situation over here. In this case, they're using the example of a bug that can swim faster than water, uh, than water's waves. Uh, in this case, we see an airplane doing exactly the same thing. It consists of two cones. You have a high pressure cone generated by the bow of the supersonic aircraft. So right here at the beginning, we're building up all this pressure. And a low pressure cone that follows towards the end of the, of the tail. So what's built up here is subtracted from back here. So you have a low pressure zone right at the back end. Um, and it's not required that the moving source be noisy, right? You can actually take a stealth aircraft with super quiet engines, or you can actually take somebody in free fall that happens to go supersonic. It has happened, in fact. And as long as they exceed this, they will form this, um, these two cones and they'll produce something called a shock wave. And here's the pressure as a cross section of this whole system right here. So here we see, uh, here we see the shock wave that's impacting. So the pressure is normal, pressure is normal. All of a sudden it hits a high pressure zone, low pressure zone. So it's a, it's a back and forth, almost like pull, push pull, uh, phenomenon. And then you're back into the normal pressure zone on the other side. That's a shock wave. Okay, so what does a shock wave sound like? Well, it's a sharp, sharp cracking sound generated by a supersonic aircraft. It actually sounds like a shotgun going off uh, maybe 100 yards away from you. It actually sounds like a gun blast. Uh, really, really neat to kind of hear. Um, but we hear them all the time. 
right? And the intensity due to overpressure and, and underpressure of atmospheric pressure between the two cones of the shock waves gives you the sonic boom. And it's produced before it broke the sound barrier, right? So for here's an ex here's a couple of classic examples: a supersonic bullet, a supersonic bullet. You know, as it's going past you, uh, you'll hear a, a, a loud crack as it goes past. Uh, the crack of a circus whip actually goes supersonic as well. Uh, thunder, right? Thunder is actually formed. Uh, you have lightning that rips through at the speed of you know very high velocity, not necessarily the speed of light, but pretty fast um, through the atmosphere. Um, and then when it separates it. Um, the atmosphere then crashes in at the speed of sound, literally, and it creates a shock wave that then spreads out. So um, and another one would be a nuclear blast, right? A nuclear explosion actually rips a hole in the uh, in the atmosphere, or 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 uh, a fireball through the atmosphere, and that produces a shock wave that then reverberates throughout the area and causes a lot of damage. Um, anyway enough about waves we're kind of done with this um, we're going to have a couple of really great lectures coming forward on music and light and Einsteinian relativity and I think you're really gonna like them so you know make sure that you keep up with the lectures and if you have any questions as always send me an email or meet me on the discussion boards until next time see you later